filling in for the GM again, who is uh, off-site playing in a tournament slash simul. Um, and this is Games You Should Know by Heart, where we pick sort of famous classic games. So if during the series you say, yeah, I already know this game, well, that's kind of the point. It's games that all club players should know at some point. I did try to pick one that maybe some people are not so familiar with. And this first game that we're going to look at, we might show two. I might show you. It's a Rubenstein game, so Rubenstein's Immortal. And I might show you my favorite one, if my favorite Rubenstein game, if we have time. Um, but this is Georg Rotlui versus Akiba Rubenstein, and it was played in Lodes 1907. Okay. Um, so we're looking at it from Rubenstein's point of view. He had the black pieces here. And as was the fashion at the time, they played the Tarash. And, uh, you know, E3 Tarash is not supposed to be so overwhelming for white. Um, mm -hmm. But okay, this is all quite normal for the time. Uh, the opening moves we'll kind of get through. Knight of six. And uh, here, white ends up taking on C5. And what's going to end up happening in this game is white is actually going to waste one or two tempi, and black is going to find a way to exploit that. So we all kind of know at the beginning of the game, you know, you kind of want to get all your stuff out in one go. You don't want to accelerate your opponent's development. So in this position, he kind of helped him out by letting black develop his bishop. If he had instead waited till black moved his bishop and then took on c5, it would cost black a turn, which is why the main moves are either taking on d5 or playing a3. Those are the main moves here. But we're going to see kind of an illustrative example of how to take advantage of the fact that you're up in development. So that's the, the first wasted tempo. Now a3, a6, b4, bishop d6. OK, so not hugely controversial so far. Um, but here, if you're in the last class, I told you in general, d2 is not a good square for the queen. And here again, it's going to be a mistake. Because white in this game is going to end up playing bishop d3 and queen e2. So a more normal square for the queen is either e2 or c2 or somewhere on this diagonal, somewhere over here. Those are sort of the normal places for a queen to go in the course of a chess game. And here, again, white is going to waste one more tempo. See, so you wasted a move letting the bishop into the game. And now he's going to waste one more tempo, and that's going to be enough, uh, as we're going to see. And this can happen a lot in a lot of games when you're ahead a, a tempo or two tempi, that it's you know you have to do something right away, but it's not always so easy to figure it out. Um, so now only after the bishop has moved did he take on c4, plays b5, um, and it's Almost a symmetrical position here, except for this queen isn't here and the bishop isn't here. Um, but after this, queen e2. Now after here in castles, it's you know a symmetrical position, but I got this rook move in kind of for free. So black kind of has to be better here because you know it's like the same position, but it's my turn and I have my rook on d8. So. We could consider a normal move. A move like this is a great move. But he decides here, and he must have calculated already, um, it's time for me to take some action. So you have to be careful when you take action in chess. It's like, OK, whenever you do something, you might be making a mistake. So you have to calculate it very well. If you don't have any immediate action, you can't do something forceful, then you would just bring your other piece into the game. But here. He plays the move knight to e5. So I'm, you have to take my knight, pretty much, because otherwise I'm taking something. Um, so takes, takes. And the reason this works is because black in this position has a threat. For example, if I do nothing, what is black's threat in this position? This is sort of key to, to understanding this position. Yes. Bishop takes pawn check. Bishop takes pawn check. Yeah, exactly. The point is queen to d6. Check, and you're on the bishop, so you win a pawn. 
Oh, did I mess up everything by clicking there? Uh, so the, the size of the board just changed slightly. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so in this, in this way, that forces White's hand in this position. You have to deal with that potential threat. So he played f4. And the bishop goes back. And again, it may look like, okay, maybe f4 is good for me. Maybe I can drive my pawn up here. That's certainly what White thought. But after e4, black spends another turn developing a piece. And white again pushes his pawn. So black has spent a lot more time developing his pieces than white. And here is where all the fun starts. So we're going to pause here forever because this is the interesting position. Um, and here black is actually winning. Though to figure it out, you have to play like an immortal. That's the only way. So at home, you do want to pause, see if you can start to figure out some of the moves. Um, I think maybe we can get some of the ideas. But uh, I will give you guys some time, so we'll pause, and uh, we'll see what you guys come up with here. OK, so this is right, an interesting move that may come to mind. And perhaps this works. Um, Queen takes is the obvious follow-up. Mm -hmm. So this is yeah a move that we're gonna sort of see in the game. Knight to g4. Yeah. So this is is on the right track for the game. Um, so you have this idea of winning your exchange back, but also queen to h4. So this is definitely on the right track, and you know maybe this works. Um, we'll ask our friend. Yeah, computer likes it. So. This probably works as well, but the game might even be even more accurate. Um, so we got all these ideas, right? We want to play here and here. We want to throw this check in. We want to like take stuff. Um, we got all these ideas, and that's what's going to happen. The tactics are going to favor us because we got all of our stuff out before white did, and we're going to get these nice bishops going on these diagonals. We're going to have the knight. Every single piece has a potential function the queen is going to go here. Um, so that's why things are going to work out for black. In the game, uh, he decided to play uh, check. And now, instead of taking the bishop, he just plays immediately rook to g4. If you take here, the point is I take your bishop. And now I'm threatening to win material here. And also rook d2 looks pretty strong. OK. So he played a move that seems very sensible. Uh, he just moved the bishop. You know, I want to trade the pieces. So I'm, I'm quite happy if you decide we'll trade the bishops. I'm not going to get mated if you trade a lot of stuff. And now what did black play here? It's actually. So finding the moves is going to start to become more and more difficult. We got sort of the right idea from the beginning. And now he played a very nice move. You spoiled it by picking the actual best move. People don't want to know the actual best move. They want to pretend like this guy played a great immortal game. So how dare you? Uh, come all the way from Germany to tell us what the actual best move is. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> Um, OK, so the point is mate. And there's not a whole lot you can really do about it. Uh, I don't know who wants to defend this, but it's not fun. Because <laughs> also you're on the rook. That's the actual best move. But it's not the most aesthetically pleasing. You know, Rubenstein, big chess artist. He loves painting a chess canvas, etc. Um, and you, you know a lot about that. You were filming like fashion and art or something today. Right. It was Swindle. It wasn't even a fashion show. It was Swindle. It wasn't even a fashion show. Um, he played a more artistic move that's also super strong. And we'll just pretend like he never said that. Knight takes h2. Ooh, nobody needs to know about that. <laughs> so what did Black actually play? The best move of all time. For this game, yeah. <laughs> Setting up for a beautiful finish. Well, the move in the game is also, it's barely, okay, knight h2 is like slightly stronger. 
Was it? Not Night H2? Right. It, yeah, not Night H2. Don't even think about that. Pretend that doesn't exist. <laughs> no one needs to know. I mean, right, because the knight is attacked. But it's an immortal game, so. Yeah, Queen H4. All right. Queen H4 was played in the game. OK, so I have to deal with this, this threat of checkmate. That's obviously the most important thing. But you'll notice, too, I did undefend this bishop. So white played uh, a quite natural move, g3. Well, I protected. I am attacking your queen. And I'm threatening your bishop. So I'm hoping. You realize, OK, you got to just trade stuff. You got to move your queen away somewhere. And OK, maybe this isn't so bad for me at all. But Rubenstein had some other ideas in mind. Uh, and so here is the beginning of a really, really fantastic position. So this is sort of the main start of a, a puzzle if you're reading this in a tactics book. So I will give you guys lots of time. There's quite a lot to figure out here. There are. There's this going on. There's this going on. There's what are these guys doing? And he's going to use all of his pieces in this attack. So we'll give you guys a couple of minutes here, and you want to pause at home because uh, I think the more you you figure this out, the prettier you'll realize it actually is. So I'll give you guys a, a minute here to think about it. All right, so Mr. Germany is coming up with all the right moves here. Rook takes c3, leaving the queen in pre. Um, so one point is you'll notice if I had taken here check, which seems like a logical move because you know my bishop was attacked, and I'm going to take it with check, and then I'll move my queen away. The problem is I can take back with my knight. I don't have to take with my queen. So the real problem is this knight. That's kind of holding the position together for white. So he took on c3, totally ignoring this. So black better be winning, or he just gave away all of his stuff. Um, and we'll see. Will he be able to actually make use of all of the stuff that's left on the board here? Well, I'll take your queen. OK? All right, I took your queen. I'm the best. Rook to d7, protecting your no, stuff. Not D7, sorry, D2, D2. Rook to d2. All right, audience is on fire. Have you guys seen this? You guys cheating over there with your phones? Yeah. What's going on? You got a book in front of you? Is, this, is that in that book? Um, yeah, look at that. Rook to d2. Um, you're trying to remove the queen from the defense of the, the bishop. Well, I mean, how do you not take it? OK, take it. Check. Queen to g2. All right, maybe we're going to trade lots of stuff. You know, maybe we're just going to go, you're going to take my queen, I'm going to take back, rook c2 check, king g3, you take my bishop, I take your knight. Um, maybe we're going to trade a lot of stuff. All right, I'll just. Whatever the outcome of that endgame is, I'll play that as white. I have no choice. Yeah? Well, rook to c2. Rook to c2 wins. But his move was prettier and better. Well, yeah, so more. embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the main continuation here? There's something funny I can do. I think I can throw like this move in or something. There's something funny I can do. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's, let's not think, though. That's too hard. So mate and six. How embarrassing. You had like mate and three or four. Um, rook f2. Then it wants to take this with either thing. Oh, gosh. That's taking way too long. We don't have time for that. Um, yeah, nobody has time. So he played an even faster win and a much prettier one. So like this is pinned. The square is attacked. 
I like that square for some reason. <laughs> Yeah. Right, that's for some reason that'll be a big hint. Knight takes h2. Knight takes h2, just ignoring that everything is doing everything to you. Yeah. No. I would highlight first that what about rook h3? What about rook h3? The final move of the game. So, yeah, the point is you're not stopping me from doing that. Your queen is pinned, so even if you take this, it's still mate. Um, so this is, OK, obviously a fantastic idea. Let's just go back just to the part where we <laughs> sacrificed here. Uh, in this position after queen h4, everything was looking great. I'm attacking your bishop. I'm attacking your queen. But just due to the strength of the bishop pair here, these raking bishops, we're able to consider sacking the queen, deflecting the queen, taking and exploiting the pin. So, OK, to many, this is Rubenstein's best game. It's obviously a fantastic tactical finish to any game. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And since we got through that pretty quick, the audience is kind of on fire. We got a good audience tonight. I will show you another game that's not very popular by Rubenstein. But in my mind, this is actually one of his best games. It's a lot more positional. So we, ta we saw him as a. Um, you know, awesome tactician. That game is obviously amazing if you get to play moves like that. Um, but here we're going to see a much different Rubenstein, a very positional approach. And in this game, uh, I like it because White just really squeezes the most out of a position. Um, he's going to have his opponent's going to have a backwards pawn, and he's going to show us how to take advantage of that fact positionally. Uh, this was played between Rubenstein and Jorg Solway from Lodes 1908. So the next year. And unsurprisingly, it was a Tarash. And unsurprisingly, he played the Rubenstein variation. And OK, this, oh, this method of playing g3 was actually considered to be so good that even Tarash himself said, this is the refutation of the Tarash. You can't play it anymore. Uh, that probably isn't true. And good people still play this today. But the main point is we put a bishop here. And we attack d5. Our knight attacks it. If we take this pawn, we have a queen that can attack this. We have a bishop that can go take this knight and remove a defender of d5. It's all about putting pressure on d5. And eventually, black will be forced to make a concession, either playing c4, which is the most common way, or to take here and then leave yourself with an isolated pawn. Um, so also, this was quite new, because he had just invented this. So black decides here to take which is not a very popular move today because of the game, queen to b6. Um, and now it's quite interesting what white did. I think a lot of people, when they see an isolated pawn, well, you want to keep that pawn there. You don't want to help black build his center. You, know, you don't want to take here. But we'll notice something quite interesting about this position. Um, why is he able to do this? And, you know, why would he get rid of his that weakness there? Well, he just castles bishop e7. And let's try to think here. Um, white now needs to come up with a plan. So let's kind of look at black's pawn structure, see if we can identify a weakness. And then we'll see if we can find a way to exploit that weakness. That's sort of a, a planning exercise that we need to do in this class. So. Um, what is the weak square? And then how should we take advantage of it? Yeah. C6, C6 is definitely a weak square. We do want to end up attacking this uh, pawn. And also what I quite like about this game is it's a good illustration of how to deal with a backwards pawn. And very often it's a three-step plan. The first step is to control the square in front of the pawn. The second step is to blockade the pawn safely. And then the third step is to bear a whole bunch of pressure down on the pawn. So we're going to see that three-step process. It's just a perfect example of it. Um, so step one, control the square in front of the pawn. So c5 is going to be the most important square for now. Let's 
control c5, then we can blockade it, and then we can eventually put a lot of pressure on the c pawn. Um, and let me give you a whole bunch of moves. What are all the different ways we can control c5? We want to think about all our pieces. Yeah. Uh, maybe bishop to uh, e3. Bishop e3. Mm -hmm. We do have to be careful because this, you know, b-pawn is attacked. But for now, we're not really calculating. Bishop to e3 definitely controls the square. You know, if you do play that right away, you have to calculate what happens if he takes here. But you also said knight to a4. So that's two pieces that can control c5. What else? It's not too early for the queen, no. And we're, so we're not actually calculating. So where could the queen possibly go where she would control c5? There's more than one answer, but c2, c2 would be one of them. And depending on where black's pieces are, OK, maybe d4. Well, no, so we're, not, we're just trying to see where they could possibly go, because we realize after knight a4, maybe this queen is going to move. Um, and OK, this guy is the only guy that really can't go there because it's a dark square. But all the other pieces can. So these rooks, some combination of doubling on the c file. And uh, it's not so obvious how black will completely control it. Obviously, he has these guys. Potentially, the knight could go somewhere where it would control c5. Uh, but it's actually white that should be able to get control of that square. So now we'll begin to calculate. Let's try to get the moves in the right order here. What do we think the first move that white played was? Knight a4. And you'll notice that white castled before doing this so that there's no checks or anything funny going on. So now your queen has to move. The queen went to b5. OK, I'm still fighting for control of this square. Continue. Queen to c2. Queen to c2 is, is an OK move. The one thing that you might want to worry about, though, too, is in this game, he actually probably didn't want to block his rooks in. He kind of wants his weakest pieces to go there first. So by starting with your strongest piece, you might limit your options going forward. But it's probably an OK move. Yeah? Bishop e3 was played. So yeah, he's determining where the weakest stuff should go first. And now rook c1 is coming. Castles, rook c1. And now we have three people here, so white totally controls the square. Bishop g4. And this is also funny. So he's like, I'll play bishop here. I'm on your e-pawn. I'm tempting you to play the move f3. But as we'll see, Rubenstein actually uses this move to his advantage. And we'll try to understand how. So it looks like a great accomplishment for black. I provoked f3. I blunted your bishop. Now what's your bishop going to do? So we still have this idea, and there's a lot of stuff going on now. We understand sort of the role of these guys and, and probably the queen, too. So what's going on on the queen side is I'm controlling c5, and I'm going to blockade it. But as we saw in the last game, he's sort of a master of using all his pieces. And another planning exercise, if you guys are in this position, what would you do with those pieces? It's, he has a very crafty maneuver. You're losing your structure for his king. Mm -hmm. Right. This would give you sort of your knight access to g4. It kind of weakens e4 in the future. Um, so this is you know, obviously one plan. And now, OK, I could push my f pawn, and then maybe I can get my, my rook into the bishop into the game. But yeah, he is sort of a master of controlling all these squares. You know, he's like, that's all, that's all me. You don't, you don't get that. Um, you don't get to do anything funny around my king. Yeah. So perhaps the option that you might do is might get a bunch of rook moves get the bishop down to mm -hmm. f1. Yeah. So that's, yeah. 
It's unlikely we're doing anything on this diagonal, unless there's some sacrifices or something, but it doesn't look promising. This looks very unlikely because you have a bishop on that diagonal. If your bishop moved, but I don't know how that bishop's going to get off the diagonal. So this is also an unlikely diagonal. So bishop f1 springs to mind. And then I can come out this way. I'll have to move my rook and my pawn. But maybe I can find a more active square over there. And uh, we're going to see what he decides to do with this rook. So we'll, we'll leave it to that for the moment. That's our square. So now we've blockaded. We controlled it. We're blockaded. And now we're going to slowly put as much pressure on c6 as possible. OK, you attacked my bishop. I defended it. And at some point, I am hoping to trade the bishops. And you'll notice he went with his bishop first and not his knight, not just because his b-pawn would be hanging. But I want to trade these guys if I'm white, because I'm trying to fight for a dark square. So trading a dark square bishop makes a lot of sense for me. Rook f2. That's the idea. And after bishop f1, pawn somewhere, rook c2. That's his idea. So that's how he's going to use all of his pieces. OK, so black fights for control of the square. I don't mind trading. But now we look at c5 again, and we realize, well, maybe black has got some control of that square. So he did remove our blockader, so we got to fight for it again. Um, and what is the most accurate move for white? There's a couple different ways. But what's the best move here for white? Yeah. How about uh, bishop f1? Uh, bishop f1 is, is uh, very good. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with this move, and he's going to play that in a second. Um, it doesn't control c5. I guess that his immediate focus was more on controlling c5 rather than improving his, his king side. Queen d4. Yeah. And that's good. A lot of people in this position, they're tempted to play a move like queen c2, which is also OK. But one of the big differences is, well, first of all, I want that square for this rook. That's, where, that's how I'm going to use all my pieces. And I'm also kind of in the way of this guy, and I want my weaker stuff. I don't want to be in the way of all my weaker stuff. And also from d4, if black ever has the idea of knight to e5, well, I've, I've stopped that for the moment. So queen to d4. All right, the rook went back. All right, I control the square, so now I have time to improve my pieces. All right, so black is, is getting ready to defend passively. e3, attacking the queen. Queen goes back, and we blockade again. Takes. We take with our rook, so we can get maximum pressure on the c-pawn. He's getting ready to defend, and white just doubles. So white has clearly secured a big positional advantage. Uh, we did everything we wanted. Now we're attacking the pawn. Everything's looking great. But it's not always so easy. OK, you achieve this position. That's great. I mean, you're, you're playing for the win here. But you need to increase the pressure. So I played a really strong move here. I wonder if the audience could see it. Bishop b5. Bishop b5, the trickiest. Let's see. Let's give black a move. Does that change your mind? It's the trickiest. I, I do give you that. So even in this position, that is the trickiest. So I could defend it again somehow or lose some material. You played the trickiest move. It's not a good night for thinking because I've been here since 9. Yeah, I should just defend my stuff. Now also good for white. Yeah. We should play b3. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and we don't have to. We don't have to be tied down with this. Well, he uh, he went one step farther. And the idea again is to put pressure on this square. So you went there with a the bishop because you're a tricky guy. He wanted to go there with a pawn. It's the same idea, except for then I'll, I'm really taking this, even if you defend it again. Um, so he kind of b5 is a big threat. So black played a6. And now actually. We have two weaknesses. Usually one's not enough, so now we got two just in case. And he immediately goes after this guy. And OK, you're just really strangled here as black, because now everybody is stuck defending everything, and white has everything covered. Rook b8. He's saying, why don't we trade? You take here, I take here. I get rid of a weakness, but white just plays a3, and black has some serious problems. Um, it's, it's not so easy for him to defend his stuff, and really he's losing a pawn here. Because after this move, we see what usually happens in these types of positions, where one player is just crushing you positionally. Well, the tactics are going to flow for the guy with the better pieces. And so here there is a little tactic. Not nearly as stunning as the first game, but uh, it is a tactic. And uh, we'll pause here to see if all right, our audience just got a lot higher rated. So we'll see if our audience can come up with the move that White played in this position. Yeah, get your stockfish out and see if you can find it. Queen e5, what's the idea? Well, you put pressure on enemy castle. You don't, you don't and putting pressure on the enemy castle? Also, trading queens is good for Right, yeah, I don't want to trade queens. That's for sure, yeah. I don't. I mean, it's still, still a lot better, but, but yeah, I don't want to trade queens. But there's something a lot more concrete. There's a, a tactic here. Oh, it's uh, castle takes uh, c6. Castle takes c6. Yeah, rook takes c6. This is the tactic. And OK, so here's the point, and we take here. OK, so we've won a pawn. Again, a big accomplishment, but you know sometimes winning these positions are, are still very tricky. So he defends his pawn, and we deny you anything on the c file. And so what do you want to take? In which? Right after, after right after queen b6. Uh, rook takes a6. Rook takes a6. Queen, take it. Yes, this is okay. Let me try to remember. Yeah, so I think this is, this should be okay. Yeah, so I'm on this guy, so I think I can take here. Um, and there was something like this that also would be okay. But I do have some counterplay. Am I missing something? Uh, can we go back to the rook b6 move? Sure. OK, rook, rook takes c6. So, uh, what, if, so what if black, would black want to trade queens instead? I'm sure he can. And again, I just you know, grabbed a pawn. This guy still is weak, so I you know, can potentially use this guy and all these guys to gang up on this guy and this guy. Um, I suppose I actually lose a war material for black. Yeah, because this is weak, and this is going to be weak. And I still have control of the c file, so you have no counterplay. Um, this shouldn't work out well for you. Um, though it is actually, it's quite bad already. <laughs> uh, there's not a whole lot of good moves. OK, so he keeps the queens on the board. So it's just a pawn, yeah. Um, but he's not playing in the knights, so <laughs> the pawn meant something. And I like this too. So his next couple moves. He just defends against anything that could ever happen on the second rank. If black ever gets active, you'll never do anything over there. Um, OK, I'm going to swing my rook to the c file, which is what happened. And you get nothing to do over there. And these are sort of annoying moves if you're defending here. OK, the guy's just improving his king. He's just fixing the pawn structure on that side. 
he's not really doing anything. And meanwhile, I have to sit here and defend and cry and, you know. <laughs> so yeah, he played here, so he's desperately trying to get some counterplay. But uh, it's not going to work because, as the audience has mentioned, he comes in, and now he has a very simple plan. Push. Yeah. Push. Push. And black resigned. So really, a positional masterpiece. Let's just go back one more time. Just really quick here. So in this position, not afraid to change the pawn structure. So there still is a backwards pawn. And then it was all about targeting c5. So we got all of his pieces to attack it. f3 actually helped us because we had a clever little maneuver. Um, so we weren't afraid to exchange. We kept control of the square. We've got all of our pieces into the attack. And then from there, the tactics eventually favored white. Um, and then upon up, with no counterplay, he was able to win the game. Just absolutely no counterplay ever. And OK, eventually black just collapsed. So that's one of my favorite Rubenstein games. Uh, so you got to see two of them here. I hope that was pretty instructive. You saw a tactics game. You saw a strategy game. And if you like that, go ahead, hit like, share, subscribe. And we'll see you guys next week. Thank you.